Hello and good morning. Welcome to your wake up call. This is Mark Curran coming to you from Vancouver, British Columbia. It's nine o'clock in the morning here in our part of the world. And uh, that's why we started your wake up call beginning of the week, just so we can start our week off to a great start. And today I'm really honored to introduce my guest. Uh, our, my guest is Mr. Dennis McKenna and he is a uh, professional and personal interests are really focused on the interdisciplinary study of ethnopharmacology and plant hallucinogens. He received his doctorate in 1984 from the University of British Columbia, which is right here in Vancouver, uh, where he got his doctoral research focused on ethnopharmacological uh, of ayahuasca and ukuhi, and he joined the Shaman Pharmaceuticals as a director of entopharmacology in 1990. And, you know, he relocated up here to uh, Abbotsford, just outside of Vancouver last year. And it's a great pleasure to have him back in Canada. And I guess on our show, we've had a number of different conversations over the past couple of years, as he's a big part of our Spirit Plant Medicine Conference that uh, is going into its 10th year this year. Dennis, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here, as always. Yeah, it's always it's always a pleasure to speak with you. And, you know, it's one of a funny story that I think I've shared with you before is, you know, my life changed into the plant medicine world. And uh, I was reintroduced to, you know, the, what people would know as the magic mushroom uh, through a girlfriend of mine. And I kind of laughed and I said, those things are still around. They're prehistoric. <laughs> I haven't seen them in like 20 years since I was like a teenager. And uh, she laughed and that was the thing. And then I started hearing about plants as medicine and, and the way that they, you know, really create healing and transformation for people. And I started jumping down the rabbit hole and I tell people and my friends that, you know, it's uh, I, I did the Terrence McKenna YouTube University. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you, I, you and a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. So yes. you know, I dove in and I, I learned a, a lot from your your late brother. And you know, if you would have, if I would have thought, you know, years later, I'd be talking to you, interviewing you, and we'd be hanging out. I never would have thought in a million years. So you know, it's just an honor and a pleasure for me to be able to connect with you and 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 share your work because you know, we, what we we're discovering and what, you know, the indigenous people known for thousands of years is these plants are teachers and there's a lot of learning and transformation that can happen from them. So maybe you can tell our audience here, as we're here with the PMC Global, we're airing on Spare Plant Medicine as well. It's all shared through our, our networks, Conscious Living Network, but maybe you can tell uh, our, our viewers what kind of brought you into this line of work and your interest um, in the work that you're doing today. Well, uh, what brought me into this, I, I guess, originally was uh, was just curiosity. Uh, I was a child of the 60s. I, I grew up in the 60s. Uh, I guess you could say I was a member of the counterculture. And uh, there was a lot of interest uh, in psychedelics at that time. It was a similar era to the present time where there was much more excitement about psychedelics, but back in the in those days, a lot of excitement and interest in mostly in LSD because that's what was around, uh, and 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 I would say a lot less knowledge uh, in the sense that now, you know, that the sixties ended in nineteen seventy more or less. It's been fifty years, you know, and although these these psychedelics have been technically prohibited. Uh, up until recently, it's beginning to loosen up a little bit, but that didn't stop people from experimenting with them and learning about them. And so in that 50-year interim period, we have actually learned a lot about how to use psychedelics for healing and personal development, uh, consciousness exploration, spiritual practices, and all this, which, of course, there's nothing new about any of this. I mean, indigenous people have been using psychedelics in this way for hard to say, but at least 10,000 years and probably much longer. So there's nothing new about psychedelics. They're, they're new to our culture, you know, and, and that's one of the uh, differences between this current era and in the sixties In the sixties, they were just this big, scary thing, you know, for a lot of people, especially those who didn't take them. You know, uh, Timothy, Timothy Leary famously remarked that uh, 
you know, LSD drives people crazy who don't take it. <laughs> right? Yeah. In other words, there's a sort of a knee-jerk reaction that this is weird and it has to be it has to be bad in some ways. It drives you crazy. Well, we've learned a lot since then, and we've learned that they're not so scary. They are powerful medicines. Properly used, they can be very helpful and very healing. And we've had the 50 years to, you know, kind of develop our own traditions and practices around the use of psychedelics. We've, we've uh, borrowed heavily from indigenous practices, uh, but we're not indigenous people. I mean, we're not... You know, I mean, everybody is indigenous to earth, I sometimes say, but, yeah. you know, we're usually not a part of a tribe or, or a particular cultural group that uses these. So we're borrowing from those traditions, but we're also inventing our own uh, methods. And often that looks like uh, a fusion between what you might call shamanism, shamanistic approaches, uh, to the use of these things and psychotherapeutic approaches. These things are not incompatible at all. You know, in fact, what's exciting right now as sort of mainstream medicine learns has rediscovered psychedelics is the, the opportunity to create new paradigms that are a fusion of traditional practices and knowledge and, and contemporary, modern, if you want to call it that, psychotherapy type practices to create a, a synthesis of these two that is really more powerful than than both uh than either one together uh, so that's exciting that at last these psychedelics medicines have been marginalized for so long in society and in medicine it's it's satisfying to see that they're being accepted gradually and uh you know i hope that continues and uh a big uh challenge is to develop the right regulatory framework for these because you can't just not regulate them there, there you know there, there needs to be a, a mechanism where they can be regulated for safety quality people can need to be educated in the proper ways to use these things but prohibition it doesn't work mm -hmm. you know i mean that is not a viable way to do it the way to do it is to educate people in terms of the medicines they choose to use how they choose to use them the potential adverse effects just you know common sense approaches uh and again here we have a body of knowledge rooted in indigenous practices that we can use, uh, you know, as a guideline to learn from. I mean, you know, uh, these plants have been used by human beings for 10, 15, 20,000 years. You know, the FDA has only existed for less than a century. You know, so in a certain sense, we don't really need the FDA to tell us whether or not we can use these medicines. You know, and, and that that's one of the points I'd also like to make. You put symbiosis in the title. Absolutely. Of our talk, and I think this is a very important issue because people have to use a plant teacher or, or a plant medicine or any plant, really, that we use beneficially, that maybe it's food, maybe we get other things from it. But to enter into a relationship with a plant you know, that, that benefits one partner, the human and the plant, usually because we cultivate it, um, you know, that's symbiosis. And, uh, you know, a mutually beneficial relationship between two organisms. And uh, I think we need to start asserting in the conversations about regulation and how to approach these plants, how to integrate them, into our society, it's important to articulate that symbiosis is a basic right, you know, and we should we should uh, assert that any person has a right to form a symbiosis with any plant or fungus that they wish to, as long as it doesn't harm other people.
and that's but that should be asserted as a you know the right to symbiosis and interestingly you could say well it's a basic human right and it is but it extends beyond the human that's mm -hmm. the interesting thing it's a basic organismal right to associate with other species that's the way the biosphere works that's the way evolution works you know most people have a view of uh, evolution as competition you know and and the fittest survive and everyone else the, the non-fit do not survive as efficiently and thus evolution progresses that does go on there is competition and evolution but more importantly symbiosis collaboration co-evolution these are the mechanisms that drive evolution forward and uh, slowly uh well even not so slowly but but you know evolutionary biology is beginning to recognize this so uh that's a more that's a much kinder and, and actually more realistic way of looking at our relationships with these plants. Uh, so it is about symbiosis. We have the right to do it. The very idea that there should be, you know, that they should be criminalized by political structures is just absurd on the face of it, you know, and, and fundamentally wrong in my opinion. Well, and, and who gives, like, we've had this conversation before in a way, it was like, who gives, you know, man really a right to make nature illegal? You know, exactly. Like, you know, these plants are growing as part of our God-given gift on this earth that it's a that's plant. Right. It's a plant. I understand a gun that we make and we kill people with, you know, that's a whole different story. But it's, how do you make plants illegal? They're part of God's natural gift for all of us. Well, yeah, very, that's exactly the point that I would make. You cannot regulate nature and you can't prohibit species. But, I mean, and it, and it bespeaks an incredible arrogance on the part of the human species, or at least our political structures, to declare that they have the right to prohibit a plant, mm -hmm. you know, to criminalize a plant. The plant is not a criminal. Exactly. You know, I mean, the plant has the properties that it has. It grows, it contains alkaloids or whatever that may give it, uh, you know, psychedelic or, or you know, analgesic or, or all sorts of medicinal effects as a result of its chemistry. And, and uh, you're, but, you're, the, you know. you're the doctor too, right? So like most pharmaceuticals, are, they're all derived basically from plants. Is that not well, true? Many of them. Right. Uh, that was truer a few years ago. Almost all medicines came from from plants or some natural source. Now, of course, we have pharmaceutical chemistry and the big pharma companies. They haven't abandoned natural products. They're interested in natural products. And many, many pharmaceutical drugs are not identical to natural products, but they're derived from them. Mm -hmm. And that's still very important. And some natural products are important in medicine still. Uh, things like Taxol, for example, which is a you know major cancer drug, comes from uh, the Pacific yew tree. You know, uh, there are many examples of natural products that are still uh, still very important. You know, uh, in my opinion, it's a but but a lot of pharmaceutical companies they don't. You know, they rely on synthetic drugs. They want to develop synthetic drugs or mm -hmm. analogs. Not so much that they're always better than the natural drugs. Sometimes they are. Very often because they're more easily patented. You know, and I think it's important to remember that the pharmaceutical industry, as, as beneficial as it's been in medicine, is basic, they're basically for-profit companies. They want to make a profit and they want to own their property. So when it comes to integrating something like mushrooms, for example, into mainstream medicine, there are all sorts of issues with respect to intellectual properties. This is indigenous knowledge. Uh, do the indigenous people 
own the plants or own the fungi. I would, they would never assert that. It's not even in their mindset, their worldview, that you would own these things. But they do own the knowledge, and we are co-opting co a lot of that knowledge. What dismays me about the pharmaceutical approach is, well, you know, so we're going to loosen the regulations around mushrooms and other psilocybin other psychedelics, loosen the regulations, make it possible to use them medically. Uh, lots of startup companies now, you know, are investing in the so-called psychedelic space. Mm -hmm. And their, their agenda is, sure, to help people make these medicines available. Let's not forget the overarching agenda is to make buckets of money. Yeah, you know, and uh, so there is that profit element that you can't really get away with. What I think, though, is that pharmaceutical companies should have their feet held to the fire in terms of you are stealing essentially or co-opting indigenous knowledge. How about giving something back yeah. to the indigenous community, to the indigenous people? That should be built into the equation, in my opinion, and. Uh, you know, there, there are ways to do this. The pharmaceutical companies don't, you know, they don't really like this approach because they, they want to own everything. And this requires them to, you know, uh, acknowledge that maybe these are not their discoveries. And there's a very big pie out there, there's, uh, you know, in terms of the revenue that should be made. So maybe they have a moral obligation to give a little bit back or actually a lot of that back to... Uh, you know, to the indigenous people that have been the stewards of the knowledge, more importantly, the stewards of the plants and the habitats that they that they grow in. The people and the and the plants live in the same habitats, you know. And so-called mainstream culture, global culture, is busy, essentially trying to wreck those ecosystems. The indigenous people have already been seriously damaged and traumatized. By colonialism, you know, uh, the, the so-called Colombian exchange and after Columbus, 90 percent of the indigenous populations were wiped out, you know, by either warfare or smallpox, which the Europeans so thoughtfully brought with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had no immunity. Indigenous people had no immunity. So that wiped out 90 percent of the indigenous people right there. So, uh, you know, the West, uh, uh, colonialists uh, have a lot to be accountable for. And, uh, and this is one of the problems. Maybe there is no way to reconcile this, but I, I think that, uh, you know, there is a way forward, but it requires, it requires an ethical compass. Uh, it requires a, a set of ethics that determine how you relate these things. This is not something that you find very much in capitalism or in big pharma. You know, the only ethic is make money, you know, and uh, that's an economic model that needs to change, not just in pharma, but, but generally, you know, I mean, as we look at the pressures on our, on our society resulting from inequality and, and marginalizing of people of color. And that of course includes indigenous people. Uh, I think we're, it's slowly dawning, dawn on us that we're not an egalitarian society. You know, we're actually a, quite a, a racist society and a, a uh, predatory in the sense of capitalist uh, predation society and uh, we need to change you know we need to change that perspective fortunately the plant teachers if you want to call them that and we can talk about the appropriate of that appropriateness of that term but we learn from the plants one of the things that one of the big take-home lessons from from psychedelics people realize that we are part of nature we're not running things. Nature is the boss. And if we needed a wake-up call on that front, I think COVID gave us a wake-up call Absolutely. loud and clear, you know, and, and that, that's another messenger from nature. You know, I mean, I mean, even COVID is a kind of symbiotic relationship, not one that we like, but one that maybe is necessary. 
Uh, it certainly it, got everybody's attention, didn't it? It got everybody's attention, and yeah. unfortunately, plant medicines have not gotten everybody's attention. It's gotten the attention of a lot of people, uh, but not enough people. Now, everybody in the world knows what COVID is, and everyone in the world on some level, I think, recognizes what that means. And, and what it means is nature is running things. You know, I've always said this. I've always said in my talks, I say the plants are running things. What do I mean by that? Well, the plants, green plants have figured out photosynthesis, this kind of miracle. I mean, it's not a miracle. It's a biochemical process. But over the course of evolution, they figured out how to take use the energy of sunlight Cap capture the energy of sun of the sun, use that energy to split water, and from that reaction, the byproduct is oxygen, and the other byproduct is simple organic compounds that then the plants can spin out into this incredible chemical diversity that we see, and what the other reactant is carbon dioxide. So it's a pretty neat system. It takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sequesters it into biological systems. And as an added benefit, especially for us, it releases oxygen as a byproduct. Well, we kind of need oxygen, right? So mm -hmm. it's a very good uh, symbiotic relationship. And Plants are the thing that are able to take energy out of the, from the sun, of the cosmos, if you will, and bind it into these biochemical processes that on the global level constitute the biosphere. I mean, this is a, the, the biosphere itself, it's sometimes called Gaia, uh, but you don't have to be a woo-woo new ager to accept that. It is Gaia. I mean, the earth is our mother, right? So Absolutely. we originated, so we can accept that. And it's a homeostatic system. It's, 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 it's made stable by these different feedback loops. All of these macro processes on the planetary scale, the, the, the atmospheric content, the temperature and salinity of the oceans, all of these things, you know, create the conditions to support life. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not an accident. Life is actively engaging in maintaining those parameters within tolerable limits. And although there's a great deal of variation, uh, you know, uh, without that, the earth would not be habitable by life. So life is making a home for itself, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as it will, making, making the planet sustainable. And then we come along, you know, and, and, expand a great deal of effort to undermine those homeostatic systems, to put a great deal of pressure on that equilibrium. Well, at some point, you know, they're amazingly resilient, right? I mean, they, they tend towards stability, but at some point you can push them so far that you reach a tipping point. And at that, at that critical juncture, it won't be able to repair itself. And unfortunately, we're approaching that now. You know, uh, it's not 30 years from now. It's not, it's, it's more like 10 years from now. Well, and, you know, take a look what's happening in, down in South America and the rainforest, the way things are all being, you know, clear cut in the jungle. But I want yeah. to back up a little bit because, you know, let's talk about, you know, like you say, it's a miracle, yet it's not a miracle. I think life is a miracle because if we take a look at how we are created here and, you know, everything that's happened, you know, to me, for, for me to believe that it just happened as an accident, you know, and a big explosion that created life, I think there's a bigger plan than that. And when we talk about symbiosis in, in terms of plants, it's brilliant because the plants don't need us as much as we need the plants, <laughs> right? Oh, absolutely. Like without yeah. us, this planet would flourish and be... <laughs> In fact, if we would go away, the biosphere would be fine. You exactly. know? And, and, I mean, it doesn't need us. No. You know? uh, um, and, and we're seeing this again with COVID because the, the, you know, the forced sort of contraction of this crazy consumerist-driven economic activity has forced us to pull our 
our elbows in a little bit, you know, and not go after this mindless consumerism, billions of people, you know, depleting the resources and suddenly the sky is clearer. Oh yeah. You know, the, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the carbon dioxide levels are, are reducing, I mean, uh, by small margins, but we get an idea of what would happen if we were not, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we are the species that is most out of sync and the biggest threat to the rest of life on earth mm -hmm. because you know i mean we're we're the rogues you know and so uh, you know uh, human human primates with these with these hypertrophied brains we are both the most dangerous species on earth and we can think of all sorts of ways in which our our presence our technology our moral uh uh, turpitude, our, you know, our lack of a moral compass, our lack of a global perspective poses great threats to the survival of life on the planet. On the other hand, you can see that we're also the most promising species in terms of being the catalytic factor that brings change, you know, in a rapid way on an evolutionary scale, you know, but it's a very powerful, uh, you know, it's a it's a very dangerous place to be. In part because we don't really have the moral clarity, we don't have the wisdom, if you will, to use properly deploy and utilize the technologies that we've created. Yeah, and and that's something that I've said too, Dennis, a number of times. It's like it blows my mind to see how brilliant we are as a species, the wisdom that we have and the way that we still continue to treat you know people poorly there you know there's no reason why there's starvation people going in lack you know this planet has the resources and we as a you know species as we refer to ourselves we have the intelligence to actually change it yet there's this whole structure of life belief capitalism and everything else that's really destroying you know the quality of life that we could have even more so for everybody on this planet right so it, it's something that has always blown my mind now let's talk about a little bit too when we talk about the legality because there's been a lot of great movements in this work that we're doing mm -hmm. um, and that's why we're educators right mm -hmm. um, you know the decriminalized nature movement in Oakland and Denver uh, it's happening here in British Columbia and Canada where there's a lot more attention being drawn to these plants and, you know, we talk about, you know, we talked about the mushroom before, you know, it grows locally here in British Columbia, along the Pacific Northwest coast in the U S you know, you can pick them pretty much almost anywhere in the world mm -hmm. if you know what you're looking for and what you're doing. So it's not like they're even hard to find if you know, um, because they grow naturally. Um, <clears throat> but when we talk about the work that's happening, like I know you do a lot of work, uh, with ayahuasca down in South America. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe you can talk to us about how these plants, because they're entheogens, you know, they wake us up. It's time for us all to wake up on this planet so that the world can heal and our, everybody can heal, the planets, the animals, ourselves. What is it that um, makes this stuff work? I, I've always considered psychedelics kind of a, you know, you can meditate for a long time and get out there, you could do your work, but psychedelics are like kind of a rocket fuel to awakening. And the natural plant teachers, you know, the mushroom, ayahuasca are two really popular ones these days that are getting a lot of attention. So, you know, what's the science behind that? And, you know, because a, a lot of people who'll be watching this are probably not fully aware and they're probably, you know, my hallucination is, and not because I'm on psychedelics, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, not everybody knows. And it's that preconceived, ooh, drugs are bad you know, from the images of the 60s and all of that stuff that kind of happened where they were really misunderstood in the mainstream. So right. kind of what's happening there and how do we um, continue to, um, you know, bring these plants forward? Well, I think, yeah, I'm very encouraged by the decriminalization movements in various, uh, various municipalities, different countries. I was pleased to see that psilocybin and presumably psilocybin mushrooms they are not the same are on the ballot this uh this coming election in oregon 
to decriminalize these things. The thing is, these things should never have been criminalized. That that was a category that we set up. The plants, you know, and that's absurd. You, you know, I mean, again, you can't criminalize nature. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can try, and we have tried, and we're seeing the consequences of that. We need to uh, get some clarity about what that really means. And I think, you know, to your earlier, the earlier part of your question, we don't really know why uh, these plants seem to, you know, as teachers, and again, this is a, a term that we should use carefully, but but we don't really, there, there seem to be built into our neural structures, sets of receptors that if you tweak them the right way, if you stimulate them with the right kind of compounds, mainly these serotonin networks, uh, you can have a spiritual experience. It seems to be the neural basis of transcendent experiences. And why it's there, it's hard to say, you know, except that for many people, psychedelics, uh, especially in their, their few, first few experiences, psychedelics uh, give people a lesson. If you want to talk about plant teachers, and the lesson is that, you know, we are out of uh, harmony with nature, you know, and that that's the basis of most of our problems. And we need to recognize that, you know, we are not running the show, nature is running the show. And we need to, however we can do it, try to bring ourselves back into harmony with nature. That requires that almost everything has to change on the economic level. It's not going to be easy, uh, you know, but, but plants are there as learning tools to help us make this transition, to help us interiorize those realizations. You know, and, and we can have the psychedelic trip, we can get these insights. The question is, what do we do after that? Mm -hmm. How do you act on the insights that you get from psychedelic experiences? And that's, you know, we have to do that. That responsibility is ours. You know, the, the plants can transmit the message, you know, and, and, and then the question is, what is our reaction to it? How do we integrate this? How do we change things? I, you know, sometimes the, the plants are called the, the, the teachers, plant teachers. That's a common indigenous view uh, that plants are teachers. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's a legitimate view. Uh, but I think it's also important that to recognize that, you know, if, if the plants are the teachers, we are the learners, but it's a dynamic process. In some ways, plants help us access parts of ourself, areas of knowledge that we already know. You know, we already know what these things are. It's just easy to forget. Plants remind us, these psychedelic uh, uh, medicines or plants remind us of who we are and where we fit in the scheme of things and remind us that we're not isolated as individuals or species. We're part of a matrix. We're part of a symbiotic network that on some on some scales is is planetary in scale and uh they help us to essentially return to or re re remember uh knowledge that indigenous people have always had you know and, and as non-indigenous people in a so-called developed cultures we've forgotten this and uh you know, so plants uh, plants are useful as catalysts for helping us remember who we are and where we fit. Uh, you know, and in that sense, they're uh, they're very useful. My my concern is that maybe they're not getting out fast enough to us. You know, and so then we need stronger wake up calls like COVID. You know, and, and that is not. It has the virtue of being impossible to ignore, 
yes. you know, uh, plant medicines can be ignored and basically are ignored by probably most people. They don't know anything about it. They don't care. Uh, and they're not familiar with, uh, you know, how important these things are. COVID uh, gets everybody's attention and hopefully will, you know, hopefully we can minimize mortality and all that. But we're seeing in the States, for an example, you know, uh, they, the states of all the countries in the world have just basically thrown up their hands. And part of that, I think, is a reflection of how fundamentally flawed our, our social models are. You know, in the states, it's very much about the individual uh, selfishness. I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. I don't care about the impact on anybody else. And so people feel personally you know, uh, entitled to not observe the the obvious common sense guidelines to minimize infection. And so, you know, there is this notion, and, and you know, in, in many countries, but I think the state is states uh, is probably the main exemplar of that. Canada is a much more egalitarian society. Uh, Canada has something built into the national mindset, the national worldview, there is such a thing as a common good, you know, and that overcomes, that transcends ideology, that transcends political differences. Canada's not a perfect society by any means, but it works a lot better than the, than the states at the moment, you know, and, uh, you know, we're, we're so, uh, the states is so, uh, sort of overcome by division and partisanship. And, and of course, our president uh, capitalizes on this. His, mm. his whole ap approach is, you know, uh, essentially driving a wedge or casting aspersions on those who are not like you, you know, not like us. So anyone who is different, then they become a target for all of this, uh, all of this hatred and that sort of thing. This is what we have to overcome. We have to realize we're all one species, you know, and we have to f live in this planet, not only with each other, but with uh, the community of sentient species. Mm -hmm. If we fail to do that, the community of sentient species will make sure that we go away. <laughs> you know, they can take care of it. Yeah, yeah, they will. I mean, I, I don't, even though we, manipulate we can manipulate forces and technologies that potentially could wipe out all of life on earth you know uh if misused hopefully that won't happen and what needs to happen before that happens is that the community of sentient species has to uh rein us in to a certain extent and and help us get on track to a more harmonious way. Plants and, and psychedelics, psychedelic plants and, and medicines are, are just catalysts. They're just tools in learning, helping us learn how to be better people, mm -hmm. you know? And the, the interesting thing, uh, sometimes say psychedelics are medicines for the soul, you know, but they are medicines for the individual soul and also for the collective soul and also for the global soul, for nature itself. They heal on all levels, you know, and uh, and so it's it's very hopeful. It's, we're very lucky that we have these things. They give us hope mm -hmm. uh, at a time where we can use that, you know, because in a lot of ways things look hopeless. So you talked earlier about the uh, the interesting bridge between the indigenous use of the plant medicines and how things are kind of being used in the psychological field or the psychiatric field or however we want to define that. But there's this, this kind of, you know, marriage happening in a way that they're taking the best of both worlds and bringing it together for healing. Um, what would you like, what would you say about, um, you know, anybody interested in doing the work? What do people look for, for, for safety, for authenticity? Uh, I know cause I've sat in some, pretty beautiful ceremonies, one with the Native American church. Uh, it was a peyote ceremony, and it was one of the most beautiful things I had witnessed and experienced just mm -hmm. because of the, the ritual that was, in, you know, engulfed in it. 
I've sat with uh, ayahuasca a number of times and the first time I had no idea, there was the first time I ever sat in a sacred ceremony of that nature and I had no idea what to expect. And it was profoundly beautiful. So what's the, uh, what do you see as that kind of mix and what people are looking for? Because set and setting is always, you know, one of the first things we always talk about, right? Yeah, the set and setting are the main variables that uh, you have to pay attention to to use psychedelics in a uh, in a constructive way, in a healing way. And setting is obviously, is obvious the setting. You need to be thoughtful about the setting, where you do it, and it needs to be, number one, it has to be a safe place. Mm -hmm. It has to be comfortable. You, you need to do it in a place where you feel that the people that are facilitating the session, whether they're shamans or therapists or whatever, have your best interests at heart. That's not always the case, you know? I mean, and it's, there are situations, there are, there are, you know, bad people out there who use this in a, as, a, as a power tool to get power mm -hmm. over people. You know, and, and because, money too, right? The commodification money as well, right? Now. You're, you're coming to a place where the point is of what you're doing is to be able to surrender, to be able to lower your defenses. So if you're in a situation where you're threatened by, you know, sexual harassment or other other elements, then you can't really be comfortable in that because you have to defend yourself. You have to be aware that you're not in a totally safe place. Mm -hmm. So I think on that level, you have to be, you know, when it comes to that, you have to be thoughtful. You have to, you have to be careful about the decisions you make about where to go, who to associate with what, which ones, you know, and that takes a, a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of research, uh, you know, but there are fortunately uh, sources of good information where you can find out those things. Then setting is much, the, the set part of this, that's the other part of the equation, is much more complicated because you can ensure a, a compatible setting, a safe and appropriate setting, but then you've got the set, which is what you bring to the table. And that's basically your mindset, you know, and it's not just your intention for the setting, although that's important. It's also essentially everything you bring to it, your personal history, your, your hangups, your problems, your disorders, your, you know, everything that is part of this complex dynamic that, uh, of what you are as a person, you're bringing that to the table. And then you're forming this symbiotic relationship with this plant, uh, you know, plant teacher, if you want to, if you want to use that term, the real dynamic, the real learning happens in this dynamic interaction between the, the person and their set and the medicine and the medicine in some ways just gives you a uh, means to discover within yourself the answers that you're seeking you know they they are there all the time but we don't always have clarity about them so psychedelics can open up a lens on this essentially let you look at things in a way that you've not looked at things before in neuroscience now, the, uh, the 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 you know current buzzword for this is the default mode network. Uh, the default mode network is essentially what I call the reality hallucination. You know, it's this artificial model of reality that our brains construct that enables us to navigate our day to day lives. It's ordinary consciousness, right? Psychedelics temporarily disable that. They let you step out of that default mode network framework. They let you step out of the box of being yourself in a certain sense. You could think of it that way and look at it from a different perspective. And I think, and, and in so doing, you can get insights about your relationship, your, your inner uh, processes and your relationship 
with everything on the outside, other people and, and the world at large, you can gain these insights so that when you step back into the box, your ordinary consciousness, some of those changes are actually, they persist, you know, they have a way of sticking around. You can actually change and the changes are long lasting. And, uh, you know, I mean, you may want to take psychedelics periodically to remember you don't forget the lessons. Some people microdose, and I think that helps them to remember. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, this is the crux of the therapeutic effects of psychedelics, whether it's for uh, like spiritual purposes or, or some, you know, identified disorder like oh, uh, trauma or things. Yeah, PTSD or addictions or this sort of thing. But fundamentally, I think the therapeutic dynamic is is the same for all of these things. It lets you step out of your re your reference frame temporarily, reassess what is happening, and then when you go back into it, the motor runs more smoothly in a certain way. It's really like resetting the computer. That's probably the best analogy. You know, when you yeah. reset your computer, a lot of the cludge that gets built up in the system goes away. It's like you purge it. Then it comes back up. The same with this default mode network. It's incredibly resistant, resilient. You, you can disable it temporarily, but it's going to come back up. But after it comes back up, after it's been cleansed in a way by the psychedelic experience, it works more efficiently. And, uh, you know, you're a better, happier person. And uh, <laughs> other people uh, also, uh, you know, can see the benefits. So, that you know, it's, it's not so complicated, but that's how they work. And you're talking earlier about integration being such an important part of the process. And it's something that we see in the work we do where it's one of the key words and key factors now, because, you know, integration is really taking the lessons you learn and bringing them into your life in a way that creates positive lasting change. And it's the same in the personal development world and anything like that. There's so many people will go out there, we'll do a conference, we'll learn a whole bunch of stuff, we'll get all excited. We put our workbook on the shelf and we call it shelf help because we're not actually integrating it into our life. We just got some new information. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's so important that when you do this work to have someone, you know, help you or it somehow work on your own integration so you can make those lessons part of your life yes that's very important that's and that's uh, you that's the uh a major component of the therapeutic dynamic and and a major component for the therapist you know that's the challenge whether the therapist is a shaman uh an actual psychotherapist or simply a sitter but their role is to be there for the person in some ways, be a sounding board of some and someone who is there to support them maybe through difficult times, but then help them integrate the lessons that they've learned. And, you know, sometimes we say the real work begins after the session, you know, after you, you go on one of these retreats and you return home, it's very easy to forget what you learned and we get, suck back into the, you know, crazy pace of life and day to day and, uh, you know, trying to do what we do to survive. It's it just reactivates the default network. It, just it reactivates it. It reactivates and it, um, I, I, I'm not saying, yeah, the default network is, uh, it's not, it, it's a good thing, you know, that we have it. I mean, because if we didn't, we wouldn't be able to, maintain uh you know day-to-day -day life i mean it is what organizes our ability to have a sense of self and be located in space and time and all of these things that we associate with and i think what happens too is we change the level of our default network right you, you know, change when it. we have it all of a sudden our default network maybe you know lack of a better term steps up a notch so that our new default isn't where it was before that's so exactly like, right. Like, almost like an elevation uh, or a, uh, I can't 
the word slips my mind, but it, you know, it's a development over time so that our default network is more empowering and more freeing for us over time. So our yeah. default then becomes much more peaceful and open than maybe That's, that unconscious kind of Western societal default. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you just said everything that needed to be said. We may as well quit now because, you know, oh, we're not going to quit. Now. So we've got about 10 minutes, Dennis. And what I want to okay. do is I want, I want to be able to talk about your work now with the McKenna Academy and the work you're doing with ayahuasca, South America and everything else, because you're doing a lot of great work in the world today. And I think the world uh, needs to know what, what you have to share and the work you're doing. Okay. Well, thank you for that, uh, that opening. Uh, yes, I, uh, I, uh, have incorporated a nonprofit called the McKenna Academy for Natural Philosophy. Uh, it's a nonprofit in Canada, and also we recently got our uh, 501c3 status in the States as well. So we're empowered as a nonprofit to give people tax deductions and that sort of thing. It, it comes out of an idea that I've had for a long time. I'm basically a teacher at heart. I love to teach. My academic uh, experiences have been the most gratifying. Uh, and, you know, although I, I never really put, I enjoyed being in the academic environment, but I didn't try to be, uh, I didn't play the game. I wasn't going after tenure and grants and that sort of thing. I, I, I was there because I wanted to impart knowledge and interact with, with intelligent students, you know, and, and propagate this message. Uh, so finally, I just decided, well, I maybe I will make my own academy, you know, and then that's the idea behind it, except it's not going to be like an ordinary uh, university or academy. It's going to be modeled after the mystery schools in the Mediterranean. It's going to be the first psychedelic university in 1500 years. Wow. So, you know, it will be it will be modeled on Eleusis which was, uh, you know, the Temple of Eleusis, the mystery school at Eleusis, almost certainly was based on the consumption of psychedelics in a very structured uh, situation. And, uh, uh, and it was the longest lived uh, mystery school in the Mediterranean, existing from about 500 BC to about 500 AD, and then it was stamped out by Christianity, which had a completely different uh, mindset. But these were matriarchal. They were uh, psychedelic. They were based on nature religions, nature worship, if you will. They embodied all the principles that we want the modern Academy, McKenna Academy to exemplify. Symbiosis, collaboration, co-evolution, you know, uh, acknowledgement that Gaia is the, you know, Gaia is our mother and Gaia is the framework that we live in. And so I want it to be a, you know, uh, I mean, the original vision, and it still is for the McKenna Academy, is that we would do educational events relating from, ranging from conferences, various places with a big focus on South America, retreats, again, primarily in South America with ayahuasca and these sorts of things. Well, that's not an option anymore for a while, you know, because of COVID, nobody's traveling and uh, it's not possible. So we've had to uh, kind of pivot and go online and we have been doing some online events and uh, we'll continue to do that. Uh, that's That was always part of the the original concept is that we would use the internet effectively as a platform for communication. I guess the difference is now that's the only platform we all <laughs> yes, have for a while. Is. But yeah. you know, uh, as you know, uh, being an internet uh, uh, shaman yourself, an internet <laughs> guru, you know the power of the internet. And uh, you know, technologies like this, uh, uh, webcasting and so on, can reach an enormously larger audience than you can reach through a schedule, uh, a conference or a retreat. Those things are still valuable. Uh, but uh, so we're, we're achieving a new uh, sort of a new appreciation for the value of these virtual events. 
and we've had a very good response to some of the ones that we've done. So well, just, virtual events are amazing. The results that you know we've been getting, you know, our mutual friend Stephen Gray, you know, mm -hmm. it all started with us. We were like, because he does his cannabis ceremonies where we use cannabis as a spiritual ally in a meditation ceremony with set and setting and proper guidance, which is a beautiful thing. And I, you know, as a cannabis user, I, you know, when I stepped into this world, looking at the spiritual side was was a, a very a big interest for me and very powerful. And what I found really interesting is we're like, well, we're an events company. What are, what are we going to do? And we just decided to actually do a cannabis ceremony online. And it was so well received that we've been, uh, you remember Theta Phoenix as well. We were doing regular sound healing journeys with her uh, now yeah. pretty much weekly. And what we've been able to do in terms of creating a container, set and setting, using Zoom, using YouTube in a couple of different ways, the feedback we have gotten, the lives we have changed and impacted digitally through a digital medium is super, super powerful. And we, we were like, Stephen and I were like, well, will it work? I don't know. Let's find out. And the feedback, <laughs> right. the feedback was so amazing that we're doing it regular, right? So yeah, the, it's been a great transition uh, based on the you know current state of the world. And uh, I know when we originally set this up, it's like we're both getting so much Zoom screen time these days. Yes, <laughs> oh Bur burnout is a distinct possibility. I approach that limit every week but but you're right these things are powerful tools and so you're by trying to stage these events online uh you're also inventing a new paradigm you're part of this kind of exploration of how can we use technology to facilitate these types of events i i don't know uh maybe well, may, I not participated in one of you uh, one of Stephen's cannabis ceremonies, so I can't say. Well, you, you did your plant medicine conference a couple of years ago. I remember. Yes, yeah, but it wasn't online, was it? No, 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 it wasn't. I, yeah. I haven't participated in the online one. I don't know. I mean, I would like to, but it may be the cannabis can fit that paradigm a little better. Something like ayahuasca. No, maybe not. Maybe We're not. Only cannabis because it's legal here in Canada so we can advertise it and share it right. and because of the nature of it it's I would say I don't know if safer is the the right word but to be able to create a container in that way digitally and most people who are going to join realistically are going to be people who are somewhat experienced has been right. our experience so it's not like somebody never smoking it that they're going to go out and do it but it's people who are interested in looking at the different way but yeah, yeah. I wouldn't do it that mushrooms or anything else by that nature at all because a you got the legal status right now and b i believe that's a really important and powerful medicine that is not meant to be without a sitter and that kind of yeah you sense. pretty much need a uh, a social context you mm -hmm. know a retreat context uh psychedelics are best used you know in group settings in small groups where there is a structure, you know, there needs to be a ritual structure. It doesn't really, I mean, it matters somewhat what the ritual structure is, but the point is there needs to be a structure. Mm -hmm. I sometimes say, uh, you know, ayahuasca is a liquid. It's going to fill whatever vessel you create for it, but you need to create a vessel. You don't spill it out on the floor and lick it up off the floor. You could take it from a vessel and, the vessel is the container, and it may be indigenous, it may be neo-shamanic, it may be a combination of these things, it may be very psychotherapeutic and highly structured in that way. The point is there's a container, uh, and that's essential. Set and setting are the dynamics, and of course, whatever the medicine is, because different sets and settings are appropriate for different medicines. And there's the uh, fourth variable, which is the dose, you know, and, and those are the key four variables that in, in fact uh, influence, uh, you know, the, the, the staging of one of these experiences and, and the likely outcome. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, and maybe one of these days we'll have virtual reality that is so 
so virtual, so real that we can have an ayahuasca ceremony in, in it. But I kind of doubt it. You know? yeah, I, it's my experience with ayahuasca, it's not something I would want to do myself. You know, I'd, I'd want to be in the container, in the vessel with the shaman and have that experience because it's a such a powerful journey that it's not something I'd want to be doing sitting on my own in front of a computer screen, right? <laughs> yeah, at, at, at least uh, initially. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I I know people who uh, who do take ayahuasca by themselves, but they that's usually not the first time. They learn yeah, over time. Yeah, how for sure. Do. But generally, it's it's a very social thing. And same with mushrooms, you know, although mushrooms, I think, are easier to use in, uh, you know, by yourself. But again, if I take mushrooms by myself, the last thing I want to do is be sitting in front of a computer screen. Mm -hmm. Well, you it's know. the one thing I, I remember learning from your brother. He, he would do it with as few people as he could possibly handle in the dark, in the quiet, sit up, sit straight shut up and pay attention <laughs> that's good that's good yeah so, and in his, my... his, his case it was pretty much a solitary thing yeah, I mean, he, yeah. Did it, he, he did it by himself a lot yeah. you know he didn't want the distraction of uh uh you know the interruption of this dialogue that does take place between yeah. you and the mushroom yeah absolutely you know? Well, Dennis, we're pretty much running out of time here. I thank you so much for, for always being available and always willing to share what the, the work you're doing. Uh, for anyone watching out there, whenever you're watching, uh, Dennis McKenna, thank you so much. And if you want to learn more about his work at uh, www.mckenna.academy, you can learn more about his work and you can tune in there and learn some more about psychedelics uh, for, for healing and, and the research and the work he's doing. Uh, if you want to reach out with me, spiritplantmedicine.com is our website there. And uh, you can always reach out to me, ask any questions uh, if you're curious, and we can always set you up with uh, more information and, and possibly some opportunities to do some work if that's something that you're interested in. But yeah, Dennis, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. It's always inspiring and you always open up my mind to a lot of different things. And I always appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Me too. It's always good good to go on. So the pleasure was at least half mine. <laughs> really appreciate it, Mark. And uh, uh, I appreciate the work that you do too. We're both part of this catalytic nexus that's trying to change things. Uh, in and we are. Direction. So, yeah. so one day at a time. Yeah. All the best. Thank you. Take care, Taryn. All right. <laughs> Thanks, bye -bye. man. Bye-bye. Yeah,